All right, today we've got the Gigabyte Aris FO32 U2P. This is the same flat 32 inch 4K QD OLED format with the semi gloss coating we've seen a few times now, so we'll try not to completely reinvent the wheel for this video. What's really unique about this monitor is that it offers DisplayPort 2.1. That's something that every other monitor in this format has failed to deliver so far. There's a lot of well deserved hype around OLED right now. Detractors are quick to point out stuff like VRR flicker, text clarity, and burn in risk as deal breakers, but I'd be willing to bet the majority of those people have not experienced to display like this in person. It's understandable. These are currently very expensive monitors. This one goes for $12.99, but the sheer quality of the image of OLED, especially a 32 inch 4K is far superior to anything I've seen in all the years I've been doing this. Full disclosure, the only monitor tech I've never really spent any time with is mini LED. In the pros column for OLED, you get exceptionally fast, gray to gray response time, significantly faster than competing display technology. And you get extreme contrast ratios. This means your blacks are really deep black, not gray. And that provides a detail and a depth to the the image that you really have to experience to understand. You get really punchy colors, you get an incredible HDR experience because each pixel is self-lit, so there's no dimming zones, no halo effect when you have extreme dark and extreme light right next to each other. You also get really impressive motion blur performance, and because these monitors have really low overshoot without needing an overdrive mode like we see on the LCD side, you also don't get any inverse ghosting, which looks like this. The higher you go up in refresh rate, the smoother this image becomes. When you get up to like 480 hertz on an OLED, it's essentially as clear as 540 on an LED display. The factory calibration is not as strong on this monitor as we've seen on competing units, particularly the ASUS PG32 UCDM. That's looking at scientific measurements. But the subjective experience of actually using this monitor versus some others that I have in house, there's no major difference. I do want to mention that all these picture preset modes do is adjust the color, the brightness, and the contrast levels of the image. None of them outside the sRGB mode, which reduces the available color range, affect the actual performance of the monitor. So it's not like choosing the FPS mode is going to provide lower latency for FPS games. It's just the visual presentation. So just go through and pick whichever one looks best for whatever game you're playing. So again, what sets this monitor apart is the inclusion of DisplayPort 2.1. This is a really deep topic, but here's the need to know stuff. Currently, every other offering in this format uses DisplayPort 1.4. We're able to achieve this combination of resolution and frame rate by using DSC or display stream compression. The overwhelming majority of people can't seem to notice any visual difference between running DSC on or running it off. I cannot. Some users say it causes a brief black screen when they're alt tabbing out of a game. And trying to use it with Nvidia's dynamic super resolution is a no go if you're using DSC. For the record, this is an Nvidia specific issue, not a DSC issue. But since we generally own our monitors for a long time versus our other components, there's a lot of talk about future proofing. There's currently no Nvidia GPUs that support DisplayPort 2.1. There's three AMD GPUs that do. Two of them don't support the full spec UHBR20. They only offer the lesser UHBR13.5 and only one, the Pro W7800 truly supports it. So having it isn't anything that's going to benefit you right now. As for the future, I'm going to operate under the pretty safe assumption that the next wave of NVIDIA GPUs will support DisplayPort 2.1. But even then, the only benefits that you're going to get on a 4K 240Hz monitor are the ability to daisy chain multiple copies of this monitor with higher refresh rates and not having to use DSC. I should point out that this monitor currently lacks the ability to disable DSC and other competing displays allow this. Even if they add this in a future firmware, there's some pretty big sacrifices to not using it. Regardless of DisplayPort 1.4 or HDMI 2.1, you'll be capped at 120 FPS if you're outputting 4K. From everything I've seen so far, it seems like a fairly small very vocal group of users who are against the idea of using DSC. Only you know if you fall in that camp or not, and I'm not discounting the experience for those users. I only say that because if this is your first time hearing about DSC, it probably hasn't been a factor for you so far. So unless you're planning on daisy chaining a lot of these monitors together, DisplayPort 2.1 might not be a factor for you either. If that's you, there's a version of this monitor without DisplayPort 2.1 for $200 less. Just so there's no confusion, I experienced zero issues using the DisplayPort 2.1 port with a current DisplayPort 1.4 GPU and cable. I realize that logically it makes more sense to recommend the monitor with the more advanced connection. It's just important to keep in perspective what it's really gonna offer you. The beauty part is that you're not sacrificing any other important features to have it included on this monitor. This has a ton of connectivity and features. It does have mic in and headphone out with an ESS Sabre DAC and speakers, though they're not up to the same level as like the LG dual mode. It has two HDMI 2.1, one full-size DisplayPort 2.1 UHB BR20, one mini DisplayPort 2.1, also with UHBR20, DisplayPort 1.4 out for daisy chaining, a USB Type-C with 90 watt power delivery, and a dual port USB hub with KVM switching. With the inclusion of DisplayPort 2.1, this monitor now leads the market in terms of
of connectivity. It can go full portrait on its stand where the Asus and the Alienware can't. It's probably the least sturdy stand though. Pretty wobbly and the cable routing is just not it. It's not the end of the world as you can put this on a monitor arm, which is easy and doesn't require an adapter, but definitely worth pointing out at this price point. It's also got some lighting on the rear, which you'll think is either cool or tacky looking. I could really go either way. And if there's a fan in here to cool this unit, I can't hear it. HDR performance is a little tricky on this monitor. There's like five preset modes and none of them are great, at least not at first. They're either really low on the peak brightness, like around 450 nits with nice tracking, or they hit a thousand nits peak brightness, but with poor tracking, like the game HDR mode, which is the best preset, but it's way too bright across the full range. This is kind of similar to what we saw in the LG dual mode, where the performance of HDR is tied to the uniform brightness setting, which is called APL Stabilize on this monitor, and it's buried deep in the OLED care menu, which is not in the regular menu. So what you want to do on this monitor is select just the regular vanilla HDR mode, then go into your OLED care menu and set APL Stabilize to high, and we get this. It's not quite as dialed as the PC32 UCDM, but not bad by any stretch. Prior to figuring this out, I rated the HDR mode pretty low, but this combination of settings really brought it home. I just wish it was a little more obvious for the average user. Important note too, that there's no Dolby Vision on this monitor. Right now, if you want it, the only place to get it is on the Alienware, and they're still massaging some issues with it and some of their HDR modes right now. This next thing isn't something that a lot of people will use probably, but I'm a huge fan of these modes, and that's the ability to simulate a smaller display area, primarily if you play competitive FPS and don't want to use a full 32-inch screen. This was a mode I really liked on the PG32 UCDM, and it offers even more flexibility here. You get a few different options for screen size, then you can send whatever resolution you want from Windows to the monitor, and it will scale the image across the smaller area of available pixels. For example, if you send a 1080p signal to the 24-inch mode, it doesn't look great. It looks pretty soft. But you can go into Windows and send a higher resolution to be scaled across the same area, like 1440p or even a 4K signal, and the result is a much cleaner looking simulated mode on the monitor. So you can experiment with whatever combination of resolution and screen mode offers you the ability to still hit 240 FPS, have a really solid level of detail, and be the right size that you need it to be. There is a button to toggle from full screen mode into whatever reduced aspect mode you have set up, similar to the LG. Do not use this button to change modes. If you do, it locks you into a 1080p max feed coming off the PC. It doesn't look great, and it completely negates all the flexibility you have with these modes. It's important to understand too that the LG allows for 480 hertz in this mode, but it also locks you into a 1080p signal from the PC and the pixel scaling looks really poor. With the Asus and with this monitor, you have a lot more control over the resolution, so you wind up with a way better looking image with the caveat that you're gonna be maxing out at 240 FPS. Text clarity is the same as we've been seeing on all the QD OLEDs. This is what it looks like at 150% scaling at 4K. I really don't think it's much of a concern at 4K, honestly. Whether in dark or light mode, I don't have any issue with this. This monitor also includes the usual burn-in features we've been seeing, and they're offering a three-year warranty with specific burn-in protection. As for VRR flicker, I am sorry to report that I did see flicker present in the testing app I used. So overall, factory calibration, I would like to see them address that gamma for SDR content. I would like to see them fix that aspect toggle button so that it functions correctly. And I would like to see them address the fact that you can't disable DSC, but all that stuff seems like it could be fixed up with a firmware update. My biggest fear was that you'd be trading off a lot to get DisplayPort 2.1, similar to how you're trading off a lot to get the dual mode functionality on the LG. But no, I sincerely don't feel like there's any major trade-offs here. This is a really strong offering. When the biggest complaint I have is a wobbly stand, they're doing something right. So there's the FO32 U2P. Big recommendation for me. Objectively, the only advantage that Asus offers is better factory calibration, but it lacks DisplayPort 2.1. And there may be some warranty reasons why you wouldn't want to invest with Asus at the moment. Unless you specifically want the curved screen that the Alienware offers, just know that you're getting a class leading monitor in the FO32 U2P. If you liked the video today, please consider subscribing. We are getting very close to 400K. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.